On today's episode of the Mark Titus Show, Groundhog's Day is here, and I promise this is not a uh, Groundhog Day bit. This is not me trying to be repetitive on purpose, but um, unfortunately, that's just how college basketball works. Some more top 10 teams lost to unranked teams. It, it, it's, it's happening. North Carolina uh, loses to Georgia Tech, finally drops a, an ACC game, which was to be expected. I don't think we expected it was going to be to Georgia Tech, though. Georgia Tech has three ACC wins, and they are over North Carolina, Duke, and Clemson, who might be the three best teams uh, in the conference. Very funny. Uh, Kentucky loses an overtime at home to Florida. John Calipari does not foul up three. It costs him a win. Um, this Kentucky team is a team I love. Uh, I love to watch, I should say. Um they are not playing defense. They, they do not play defense, and uh, at some point they should try that. Uh, meanwhile, Tennessee loses at home to South Carolina. Dalton Connect with a big game, but it's not enough. The South Carolina Gamecocks are still somehow unranked. Uh, you have to imagine that they will be ranked on Monday if they can win at Georgia. Now, the problem with that is Georgia has already beat South Carolina in South Carolina, so uh, that's far from a guarantee. The point is, as has been the case all season, the parity – uh, has been turned up to 11 in college basketball. It is absolutely crazy. We almost got another top 10 upset, top 5 upset, top 2 upset uh, in, in college basketball. Last night, or two nights ago, for those of you listening, uh, Purdue at home got taken to overtime by Northwestern, a team that already beat them in Evanston. Uh, but the Boilers hang on. Chris Collins gets ejected. Uh, a lot of talk about the foul discrepancy, the free throw discrepancy, the fouls, and the styles of play, and... Um, all that sort of thing, as is often the case with Purdue. Uh, Purdue is the talking point of college basketball this season. There are a lot of great teams. I'm not saying that Purdue is the best team. I'm not saying that uh, you know it should be this way. It just is. Purdue, having a Zach Eady and, and uh, one, how good he is, but two, how controversial some of the plays are. And screenshot Twitter goes crazy with uh, you know his elbow was hooked here and he's pushing this guy here and all that sort of thing. Um, anyway... I have uh, an old friend, Bobby Riddell, who is the color, the radio color analyst for Purdue basketball, uh, joining me today to talk about basically where we're at in this Purdue season. Uh, this has been the last couple of years Purdue has had good teams. This is about the part of the season where there are cracks in the dam. This is this is the part of the year where not everything goes wrong. Obviously, we know of the NCAA tournament struggles in the past, but uh, Purdue right around February. They for for two years in a row now, Purdue has had dominant records. They they've they've had a couple losses here and there. Obviously, it's very hard to go twenty plus, you know, and oh, it's not like they've been perfect, but they have looked to be one of the best teams in the country. And then around February, you start seeing some some weaknesses shining through, and then eventually it all caps off with a with a devastating loss in March. That has been the pattern so far. We are at that point in the season now with Purdue. Big game coming up against Wisconsin on Sunday, uh, which isn't to say if they lose that game, it's an aha, here it goes, they're going to fall apart now moment, but maybe it will be. I don't know. Point is, uh, Bobby Riddell is, is, is on the show today to talk about Purdue and just kind of uh, revisit – now that we're very close to now that the calendar's turned to February and and it's starting to become a little more real and that that March Madness that Selection Sunday is is there waiting. Uh, where are we at with Purdue? What are the differences between last year and this year? And how confident should we be that that last year was last year and uh, it's not going to happen again this year? All that sort of thing. Had a great conversation with Bobby. I've known Bobby for over half my life now. We used to play against each other uh, both in high school. Um, did not play against each other in college, but he was on Purdue and I was on Ohio State. It was just more that we didn't play. Uh, Bobby got a lot more minutes than I did. Bobby was a uh, way better basketball player than I was. He got on the floor a lot for Purdue, but uh, I never had the opportunity to play against him in college because I, frankly, had the oppor never really had the opportunity to play against anybody in college. Uh, but that's the way it goes. But I've known Bobby forever. He's calling games for Purdue now, and I thought, who better to have on the show than to get into the nitty-gritty about Purdue basketball than Bobby Riddell. So uh, that's coming up. Let's get to it. All right, Bobby Riddell uh, coming up in a second. Um, excited to talk to him. It's excited to. It's it's hard to talk about Purdue and not. And this is this is me speaking on my own experience, but also just like basically everybody that's not a Purdue fan. It's hard to talk about Purdue basketball and, and not devolve into jokes or uh, really just jokes. I mean, it's it's hard not to. It, I mean, it, it's. It sucks that that's the reality, but um, when when you've when you've had the NCAA tournament failures that they've had, and um, at the same time been as successful as they've been as a program, it's just a weird 
uh, mix of success, but obviously failure and, uh, and all that. And it's hard to just have like a serious conversation and be like, I like this guy, you know, that that's playing better than he was last year. And I, I enjoy watching this or whatever else. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I'm fired up to talk to Bobby cause, uh, I, I get, I get lost in the sauce a little bit too much and I start, uh, you know, like everybody else, Purdue comes up, you want to, you want to just make some Purdue basketball jokes. It's, it's something I've done my entire life, but, uh, at the same time, they are as of right now, the betting favorite to win the national championship. So it's time as, as, as much as everyone wants to pretend like they don't need to, it is time to start seriously considering a world where Purdue basketball is your national champion. That's all. Be prepared to talk to your children about a world where Purdue wins the national championship. Um, I, I, I wrote all this stuff down. I want to read real quick before we, we talk to Bobby because, uh, as I said at the top, top top ranked teams are losing to unranked teams. For a sport that uh, is chaotic and, and is madness at all times, I, I continue to just be like, well, well damn, it happened again, uh, which is crazy, and, and, and I shouldn't be surprised, but uh, th- that's where we're at with college basketball. So to, to point out how insane this season is, and, uh, you know, again, it is Groundhog Day, and this does feel a little repetitive at a certain point because that's what college basketball is, and, and the parody is why we keep coming back and all that sort of thing. But the parody has been is, – is especially wild this year. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just list some things that, that point out that, – that make my point for me. Um, so these are – these are, I'm just looking at conference standings. I'm looking at uh, all the power conferences, the Pac-12, the ACC, the Big Ten, the SEC, the Big East, and the Big 12. Um, you look at all those conferences and the the standings right now. Now, not, not every team has played similar schedules, and, and now with how big the conferences are, um, even at the end of the regular season, not every team plays the same schedule. So it doesn't always tell you everything when you see who's at the top of the conference standings. It's not always necessarily the absolute best team. And it, that's not how it always works. But just to illustrate the parity we're dealing with at, at high major college basketball this season, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through it this way. In the Pac-12, the Arizona Wildcats are in first place at 6-3. and three. They are 6-3 and three in conference play so far. They are in first place. One of those three losses was to Oregon State, who is in 11th place. Um, you know, that just shows – it's not – I remember – the college basketball that made sense in my mind when I was growing up and, and, and at Ohio State and all that was like there was a pecking order. At the top, there were there was this tier that could win the conference. There was a middle tier that could knock off the guys at the top tier, but they weren't good enough to actually win the conference because they couldn't sustain it the whole time. And then you had your, your, your basement bottom dwellers that uh, are going to win one or two conference games this year, and it, they're probably going to be against each other. And should one of those beat one of the guys in a tier above them, that's a big deal. If one of those teams were able to pull off an upset of a team that's like one of the contenders, that is absolutely shocking. And it's happening in basically every conference this year. So we got Arizona has lost to Oregon State, who's in 11th place. In the ACC, North Carolina is in first place at 9-1. and They were 9-0 and going into Atlanta, just lost to Georgia Tech, who is in 13th place in the ACC. The, Georgia, the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets, despite wins over North Carolina, Duke, and Clemson, are in 13th place in a bad ACC conference, but one of their wins is over the team in first place. And one of their wins, as it would happen, is over the team in second place, the Duke Blue Devils as well. So uh, that, that's where the ACC stands. In the Big Ten, Wisconsin, as of right now, is in first place at 8-1. and one. They do play Nebraska tonight. Um, so those of you listening, maybe they just got upset by Nebraska. Uh, they Their one loss is to Penn State, who is 10th in the conference right now. Uh, tied for 10th, I should say. So, like, who knows where Penn State's going to end up? Penn State's not a an atrocious basketball team, but yeah, they're not a they're not anything to write home about this year. And and they they are the only team in the Big Ten that has beat the Wisconsin Badgers this year. Uh, in the SEC, you have the you have Auburn, Alabama's at the top. Um, they they lost at Tennessee, uh, which isn't really a bad loss. But in second place, you have Auburn, who is six and two. One of their losses was at Alabama, who's in first place. Their other loss is to Mississippi State, who is currently in 11th place in the SEC. So you have 11th place having knocked off second place, and and this Auburn team could end up winning the SEC, absolutely. Uh, so that's noteworthy. That Mississippi State team, by the way, not that bad. I'm just that's not the point of this exercise. I'm not trying to say that like all the teams that are, you know, it's embarrassing to lose to a team that bad. What I'm trying to point out is that across the board in college basketball, the parity is out of control. That the teams that are towards the bottom of the standings or beating the teams towards the top. And, and I don't know the way I remember it, that, that, that 
doesn't really happen. And when it does across every single conference, it's pretty wild. In the Big East, Creighton is currently tied for second at 7-3 and three with Marquette. Uh, they are both 7-3. and three. And the Creighton Blue Jays lost at home to Villanova, who is currently in ninth place in the conference. And meanwhile, in the Big 12, uh, Kansas is not in the lead in the Big 12. It is Houston. Houston sits atop the Big 12 standings, but they do play this weekend. Kansas is at home. And Kansas uh, is in, tied for fourth place at 5-3, and three, but they're only a game back of Houston. If they do beat Houston, they will be tied in the conference. And uh, Kansas has won 17 of the last 19 Big 12 regular season titles. So, I mean, working under the assumption that it's Kansas's conference until proven otherwise. Now, if Houston beats Kansas, uh, we can revisit that. But right now, it's – I, I'm still, even though Kansas is in fourth place, it still sort of feels like it's Kansas's title to lose until someone takes it from them. And having said all that, in spite of all that, the Kansas Jayhawks have lost to UCF and West Virginia, who are both tied for 10th place in the Big 12. Um, so there you have it. That is uh, that that is my little exercise to point out that, that all of these teams that are very near the top and very – I mean, if, if I told you at the end of this regular season, Arizona, North Carolina, Wisconsin, Auburn, Creighton, and Kansas all won their conferences, I think the only one I'd really be, like, super surprised by is Creighton, and that's more because of how good UConn is. Uh, but the rest I wouldn't be surprised at all. I mean, hell, Wisconsin, Carolina, and Arizona, absolutely not there in first right now. Um, Kansas is not, but like I just said, you got Houston at home. You beat Houston. You're back, uh, you're, you're back right there, and, uh, you know, Allen Fieldhouse is worth two or three wins a year. And and Kansas owns that conference, so I w- I would never I'm ne- I will never under any circumstances be surprised if Kansas wins the Big Twelve, and Auburn is is absolutely a team good enough to win the SEC. I don't expect them to, but uh, with Kentucky and Tennessee both losing this week, and and one of them is going to lose again on Saturday, uh, yeah, Auburn Auburn's in a good spot to win the SEC. So, in spite of all that, all of these teams that are in in the running to win their conference championships are losing to teams that are very much not in the running to win their conference championships. And yes, in a in a one game situation, that sort of thing happens. And I guess the whole point of this is that it is happening a lot this season. It is, ha- it is not, it is not just that the teams at the top are losing. Um, it is that the teams at the top are losing the teams that are not even close to the top. And uh, that doesn't mean that the teams towards the bottom stink. It just, that's where we're at with college basketball. And I am excited for March madness because Good luck having any idea what the hell is going to happen. The only teams that I – I mean, it's Purdue, it's Houston. For now, we're going to see, though. I, 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 I hate that I keep doubting Houston, but I just – I this is it. I mean, this weekend is it. It's 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 Houston at Kansas. They don't have to win, but, um, you know, I, I the, the fear is that, that Kansas just smothers them alive and, and Houston is uh, gets their welcome to the Big 12 moment in earnest. Uh and Lawrence this weekend, um, if they don't, and, and if Houston wins, and if Houston wins convincingly, I, I think Houston is very much a team that uh, we all need to be taking very, very seriously. But it's 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 UConn and it's Purdue, and I don't really know after that. Like, I don't know who I, I really feel that strongly about. Wisconsin's up there, too. There are certainly teams in the mix, but, boy, it's going to be absolutely wide open in March, and, and that's what we want out of the sport. So, uh, Having said all that, let's talk about one of the teams that I do believe in right now, but I also, sticking with the Groundhog Day theme, we've been here before. We've been here before with the Boilermakers, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need Bobby Riddell's help uh, convincing me that this year is different. So uh, here is Purdue Radio color analyst and uh, a longtime friend of mine, Bobby Riddell. <laughs> Quick break to talk about our friends at All Athlete. One of the things I am working on in 2024, I've said this a few times now, and it is true, I am working on it, is my vertical jump. Believe it or not, I am working on my vertical jump. Uh, My friend Greg has an incredible new feature in the All Athlete app that allows you to measure your height, wingspan, vertical jump, and 20-plus other measurements just by using your iPhone Pro. Uh, I'm pulling out mine right now. I'm pulling out my All Athlete. Um profile i gotta get this pulled up uh i just did my vertical jump the other day with with cody uh everybody lock in everybody have your guests i'm for those of you playing at home go ahead think in your head i'm 36 years old i was never that athletic to begin with but you know i was a decent athlete what do you think my vertical jump is survey says 22 inches we measured it at 22 inches which i feel good about honestly uh and i made sure 
on the uh, the All Athlete app, I made sure to, to include the note that I had just eaten a chicken parm sandwich right before I did it. So, like, you know, that probably – had I not had the heavy chicken parm, that probably would have added, like, six or seven inches, surely. Uh, if you can think – if you think you can beat my vertical jump, download the All Athlete app and give it a try. The person with the highest jump will win a $100 Amazon gift card. All you have to do is download the app, screenshot your vertical jump, and post it to Twitter along with the hashtag – Titus Jump and tag at All Athlete Inc. That's it. Use hashtag Titus Jump. Send it to at All Athlete Inc. Um, go go record your vertical jump in the All Athlete app and uh, send it to them, and, and you can win a hundred dollars if if you think you can beat me. Now, twenty two inches is I don't know. I have I haven't done the research to see if that is the highest vertical jump on All Athlete, but uh, I think it's got to be pretty close, right? Think you can beat my vertical jump? Download the All Athlete app. For a chance to win a hundred dollar Amazon gift card, go do that now. All athlete. All right, Bobby Buckets, Bobby Riddell is joining us now. Uh, Purdue legend. I'll I'll say legend. I'm not afraid to say it. Um, you you know this team really well, and I think uh, you know no disrespect to UConn, who is the number one team in the country and the defending national champions. I do think that this this season of college basketball is a Purdue season, which is to say, Purdue is the team that most of the casual fans have our eye on in the sense that Zach Eady is obviously the reigning national player of the year is probably going to win it again this year. Um, but then last year, Purdue season being so good all all season, losing in the tournament in the way they did and bringing that group back, I think all eyes are just on Purdue because it's just such a compelling story as it's going on. I thought, let's have Bobby on. He knows the Boilers better than anybody. Um, and we're talking to Bobby the night after the uh, the big Northwestern game. So I guess I want to start there. Like, why is – why is Northwestern such a problem for Purdue the last couple of years? Yeah, they've certainly been a, a bad matchup, as yeah. you like to call it, uh, for us a little bit here the last couple of years. And, you know, Boo Booey, I suppose, would be you know, the main culprit there as far as, you know, he's just an elite guard. And he's a bad matchup for a lot of people, of course. But, yeah, for us, um, you know, our perimeter defense is probably one of our areas uh, of weakness, I suppose, as far as if you look at our team as a whole. Um, definitely not one of our strengths. And, and so when they have Boo Booey and plus a couple other perimeter players last year, Chase Adige, this year, Ty Berry and Ryan Langborg was pretty good player as well. You know, those guys have been able to get buckets on us, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and I feel like their defensive game plan, you know, they have that, uh, they double the post big to big on the catch. And so they're trying to, to limit Zach Eadie's effectiveness on the block as much as they can as far as his one-on-one -on -one moves and uh they do a good job of that as far as i think last night he only had two field goal attempts for a good portion of the game um until he started getting their entire front line in yeah. foul trouble but uh yeah so they, they just they have a scheme that has been successful and, and they got some really good guard play that has given us fits uh so outside of west lafayette and and purdue fans in general um the thought of talking about Purdue throughout this season, there, there, you, you get met with a lot of who cares. Let's just wait till March. Who cares? Like when they get to March, they're going to blow it. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? What, as a guy who's like around the program and in it as, as, as much as you are, give me like an honest assessment. How much do you think March and the NCAA tournament and the past few years of Purdue's, you know, shortcomings in the NCAA tournament, how much does that, uh, I don't know necessarily way on, on Matt Painter's mind, but how much is that, how much thought is given to that throughout the season? Like we have to keep playing for March and how much of it is just like win the game in front of us right now. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the majority of it is just win the game in front of you. Right. Cause okay. you have to put yourself in position to be in position. Right. So obviously last year we had a really successful regular season. We put ourselves in a great spot, getting that one seed. And unfortunately, you know, we did not deliver in the tournament, but you know, this, the analytics show that if you get a one seed, you're, you have a better chance to make the final four than all the other seeds below you. So obviously that's because typically you're one of the best teams as well. So I think it's more of just, Hey, we got to win the next game. We got to get ourselves a big time resume, get that one seed once again. And then, you know, you, you hope and that uh, you have some better luck this time around. So for all my all, all my audience that, that doesn't watch a ton of Purdue, maybe, um, what would you say? Because on, on, on paper, the rosters, uh, you know, I know Lance Jones is in the mix now and, and, you know, Brandon Newman and David Jenkins are out. There, there are a few tweaks here and there. But for the most part, it's the same group of guys from last year. Uh, what would you say is the biggest difference between Purdue last year and this year that, that gives you confidence and, and hope uh, moving through the rest of the season? 
Well, well you kind of said it. I mean, the Lance Jones acquisition, just as a whole, as far as what his strengths are as a player, really complement, you know, the fill in the missing blanks as far as what we didn't have last year. Just another guy who is unafraid to take big shots and big moments, a guy who's actually got some real juice with the basketball. Uh, you know, we would struggle a lot of times last season when teams would full court press or really ramp up the pressure on the perimeter just because Braden was really our, our only guy who could kind of, you know, make a play off the dribble. And so Nets now have a second guy to where if you really want to get out there and pressure, you know, he can blow by you off the bounce and create for himself or others and just steal easy baskets, right? Like how many easy baskets has he still stolen for us in transition this yeah. year or off steals that we just were not generating last year? We were just such a half court driven team. And when you have Zach Eady, you're very successful in that, but it, it's nice to be able to steal points in other areas when you play against a good half court defensive team. So I think Lance is clearly the guy who's raised our ceiling. And then yeah. obviously Brandon Fletcher being a year older has really helped as well. Yeah. Lance is so good at uh, killing momentum or like just hitting the big shot in the big moment or, you know, having like when Ruck, the Rutgers game comes to mind where Rutgers, you know, necessarily wasn't, like Rutgers was about to pull off the upset, but like Purdue has history with Rutgers. And uh, I think the Rutgers fans started slowly talking themselves into it. Like the second half, you're looking up and they cut it the fourth. And then yeah, I, I remember he had like a steal on an outlet pass and, yep. and just immediately, like you could just feel the air in the building just kind of drop a little bit. And, uh, and yeah, against Northwestern, he hits big threes back to back. And he's just got like, I love, I love Lance Jones so much. Having like his senior leadership is uh, incredible. You brought up Braden Smith. I feel, and, and feel free to disagree, Bobby, but I feel like Braden Smith last year was not a bad basketball player, but he did fit the mold of like what you would call a game manager. Whereas this year he is absolutely a playmaker. Do you think that that is a fair assessment that he has made a, a monumental leap? Or do you feel like this is just kind of like the same guy he's always been? Um, and he's just, you know, it's just the perception of him has changed. Yeah. I mean, it's a couple of things. I think, one, we're shooting the basketball as a team, like, way better. So he had a bunch of really nice passes last year that guys would then just miss the open yeah, shot. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Like, it doesn't look like it's a, as great a pass, obviously. The ball doesn't go in. So there's that piece of things. We're just shooting the ball better as a team, so he's getting more assists, so on and so forth. But I do agree with you. I think his confidence level has taken a step up. And I feel like from that standpoint, last year he was a stud, second-best player on a team that wins the Big Ten regular season. But I feel like when things started to struggle for him mid, like in game, like miss a couple shots, maybe a couple turnovers, I don't think he kept his confidence as high as it obviously needed to be to, yeah. to persevere through that at times. Whereas this year, I feel like he's able to work through struggles in game a lot better because he's more self confident in himself and he understands, like, you know, he he's a, our second best player and a guy who's performed at a high level on this team now for a couple of years. So I think it's a confidence thing. I think he totally knows he belongs at this point. Whereas last year there was probably some of that uncertainty maybe uh, throughout the course of games when he struggled. He's got such a swagger this year. Um, yeah. 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 He's, he's, he's awesome. Uh, he makes it hard for, he, he's, he's so easy to root for, you know, him and Fletcher both are so, so easy to root for. And um, yeah, this Purdue team is, is, is a ton of fun. So, uh, I mean, let's talk about Edie a little bit. Edie is a, uh, you know, he's he's a guy who's often debated by by everybody else, and and when he's long gone from Purdue, I'm sure people will still be arguing about how good of a player he actually was, and and his importance to college basketball, and uh, there will never be a resolution from outsiders within the program itself. Um, just like what 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 do you see, Zach? Assuming this is his final season, because he can come back next year, which is crazy to me. Isn't that wild? Um, uh, Zach Eady's legacy in a program that is uh, full of legends and and has won more Big Ten championships than anybody else. Um, just speak on that a little bit. Like his all time Purdue stature as it stands right right now. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's one of those things, just like anything in life, right? It's hard to appreciate it as much when when you're in the moment with it, but. I mean, what the guy's doing on a nightly basis is just absurd. Like, yeah. I was talking with, with uh, Robbie Hummel after the game, actually, yesterday, because he called it, um, and he was talking about how he put up 30 and 10 one time in his career, and he thought he was, like, the baddest dude yeah. on the planet and after he put up 30 and 10. And that might have been actually – I don't know if that was the game against Ohio State. Was actually, that the – the, that might have been. I mean, Robbie might had, like, 25 night, a half or something, so he, yeah. I'm sure he got 30, yeah. It could have ended up being that night. But, you know, he was like – thinking he was the man he goes and Zach literally does that like every night yeah <laughs> like, so he, he obviously what he's doing from a, a number standpoint is, is ridiculous he's now in the 2000 point club 
a hundred or a thousand rebound club. He's a couple blocks away from being 200 blocks. And then he shoots above 60% from the field. If he does that, if he gets three more blocks, I think he'll be the only guy besides David Robinson and Patrick Ewing, who are uh, the dream team center. So obviously we feel highly, we think highly of those guys. So think about that rare air that he's going to put himself in if he does that. So, yeah, I mean, he's just a beast and his physicality just, it's like, I try to compare it to like, an elite offensive line like throughout the course of a game they just completely wear you down so then by the end you're just so fatigued and like he just ends up wearing you down right just and getting throughout the course of 40 minutes and obviously i know there's a lot of debate on the fouls and all this stuff like but he's a massive human being like you're going to have to go the extra mile to try to stop him and a lot of times going the extra mile is, is a foul so yeah Another quick break to talk about our friends at Roback Activewear. You guys all know how much we love Roback. Best fit, best feel. We can't go anywhere without seeing someone wearing a Roback Performance hoodie. Simply put, these are so soft you will not be able to take them off. You also should uh, hook yourself up while you're buying the hoodie. You should hook yourself up with uh, the Roback Performance joggers. I'm wearing some of the Performance joggers right now. They are made to move. They are made to move in and are incredibly comfortable. Some would say the best duo on the market. On the market, I could not disagree. I wear Roback basically every day. Every single day I come into this office, I'm wearing something Roback. It is very rare that I'm not. Uh, today I'm wearing a Roback hat. I'm wearing a Ro- Roback joggers. Tomorrow I'll probably be wearing a Roback hoodie. Uh, they also just restocked their Performance crewnecks. And when we say they are soft, we mean it made with Butterflex fabric. I'll say it again. It's Butterflex fabric. How, how soft does that sound? It is soft to the skin with stretch that allows you to move. So check out Roback and use code Titus on Roback.com for 20% off your first purchase. That's R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com, 20% off performance hoodies, crewnecks, joggers, and more with code Titus, Roback.com. I, uh, I, I've obsessed some Purdue fans this morning, Bobby, which is uh, um, really heartbreaking because I am a Purdue booster, and you know this, that every every year on the day of giving, I give money to Purdue. I don't even give money to Ohio State, and I give money to Purdue, which speaks to uh, you know how highly I think of this program. And um, to have my, my fellow Purdue fans uh, chirping at me, is it, it, it's got me in a little bit of a tizzy, but I, I said on my other show this morning that um, – I, I, I appreciate Edie. I like Edie a lot. I, I don't think he's a bad basketball. I'm not one of those guys that's like he's only good because he's tall because Purdue has had – you guys have had a, a seven-plus footer for how many years now, and none of them have been as good as Zach Edie. Like and then we're going to be back-to-back national Yeah, here. right. There's a reason he's he's putting up numbers that Isaac Hostin and Matt Harms – you know, it's because he is very, very good. Um, but if I'm being completely honest, Bobby, and this is just two guys talking. I've known you a long time. We're just being honest with each other. Um, the, the Zach Eady experience, I'm just kind of, I don't hate it. I'm just kind of like, I've seen this already. And I am one of those guys that I want to get to March. So like, how, help me with that. Because, uh, when I do watch him, I don't think he fouls all the time. I don't think the refs are, are, you know, coming out of the Northwestern game. That's a big discussion. I don't, I don't think it's like, I, I get all that. I'm not trying to argue that. What I'm saying is just purely as a basketball fan, um, watching, watching the like sumo wrestling with Zach Eady, I'm just kind of like, I've seen it already. Um, I do appreciate him. I like him. I just kind of want to pick him up and put him over here and then watch Lance Jones and Braden Smith and, you know, like all the other guys cook. I want to watch the other guys and I just have to keep watching Edie. So help me, help me love Zach Edie again. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's part of, it's just the way basketball has gone, right? It's, it's gotten away a little bit from the basketball. We grew up where you're watching, you know, Ewing and Robinson, Elijah yeah. and Jack and all these bigs dominate the game. Um, as far as the majority of the teams across like the NBA, for example, and then in college, of course, there was a bunch of dominant bigs too. You know, there's not as many dominant bigs now. It's a lot more of a guards game, which I think for you and I guys who like shooting the three and yeah. all that stuff, it's more appealing to us. So I get it. Like I would rather watch guys shoot threes than watch jump hooks as well. But um, you know, to coach painter's credit, what he's done a good job over these years is when he's got a great post player, he is wearing out the post. Yeah. And that's, of course, what you're talking about. Like, we see a lot of these Zach Eady fouls and tangles up because we wear it out. Yeah. Like, we're not going to let you off the hook um, because it's probably a bad matchup for you. Right. Because Zach Eady's a beast. Like, so we wear it out. But, you know, when we had Carson Edwards and Ryan Klein, you know, we were shooting a ton of threes mm-hmm. and, and doing that. So some of it's been we've been able to kind of monopolize to some degree the – you know, seven foot center or whatever. And, you know, it's maybe it's been tougher for Purdue as far as maybe getting some of those high end guards. So we've had to go the big route. 
Edie's got to shoot some threes. I think that's it. Not even yeah. every game, just like once every four games. Like a Brooke Lopez yeah. or something. Like just, step out and just, just like yeah. once every four games when you're up 20, just like step out and shoot one. That's all I ask. And then it just gives me something yeah. different to be like, oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> you know. No, um, for sure. If, if he had like the Mo Wagner thing or the Hunter Dickinson where he could step out and splash yeah. whenever once in a while, that would definitely be, be great. But. I, yeah, he's uh no, he's just gonna wear you out on the block. You guys aren't done with seven footers, are you? You got others coming down the pipeline, if I if I remember correctly. Yeah, we do. I mean, we have the <laughs> the kid who's already on the roster, Willie Berg, who uh, the staff likes. Uh, you know, he redshirted last year, and he so he's a redshirt freshman. But then we got uh, Daniel Jacobson, a true freshman, coming in next year, who um, is more, I think, built. He's built more like a Matt Harms, but he supposedly can shoot the three a little bit. So maybe you'll be, maybe you'll like his game more. Yeah. Um. All right, so uh, what what is the you know I don't I don't want to uh, I don't want to put you in a bad spot where you're giving other people scouting reports here, but like if you were to talk because so there are times where I watch Purdue and I'm like, how does anybody beat this team? I, it makes no sense uh, the talent you're putting around Zach Eady and how well they play together, and um, it, it's it's th there seems to be no ego on the team. Uh, they're great offensively, obviously, probably the best offense in college basketball. Very good defensively. How does this team ever lose? And then every so often you look up and, and you know, Nebraska's running them off the floor. And Northwestern, uh, Northwestern's not a bad team, but, like, the idea that Northwestern – make every shot against Yeah, them. yeah, like, make every shot. very good game plan. Yeah, exactly. So I was going to ask you, like, what is the – like, when those moments happen and, and as Purdue fans are thinking the worst and they're like, uh-oh, is it going to happen again? Like, what what is – what does that look like? What is the – you know, I know it's – I don't mean to twist the knife, but, like, what is the nightmare scenario for this this specific group of Purdue basketball? Like, how do you go about beating them? Because, uh, you know, only two teams have been successful at it this year, and, and even even Northwestern when they did when that game went to overtime too, so. No, I mean, for sure. It's it's unfortunate the way, you know, with the team – with Purdue's team is this year because I feel like take a – you know, if we played a seven-game series or five-game series against the majority of the teams in the country, I, you know, I, would, I think we would – come out on top yeah. but that's not obviously not the way March Madness works and so we've seen a couple of games this year already where if the opposition goes ballistic from three and, and is shooting the ball at a high level I already talked about our perimeter defense you know is definitely not our strength I feel like Lance Jones has definitely helped that but you know we're, we're by no means just Houston on the defensive end on the perimeter you know locking people down so there's going to be some games where teams get open shots and uh, if they get really hot like we've seen Nebraska and Northwestern do then we obviously have to play, you know, Alabama couldn't miss against us, but we offensively this year are kind of a notch up as well to where we've been able to win some of these games like Alabama and Northwestern last night because our offense is so good as well. That's what does make me feel better is we can win these shootouts. But in a one game scenario, we have lost two games this year. We've seen where if you're not at your best offensively, another team is red hot, you could be in big trouble. And, and that's, you know, as a Purdue, yeah. Purdue fan, first and foremost, thinking about the NCAA tournament, you just hope that game doesn't happen, you know, when it matters most. And you hope that happens in like February or something or doesn't happen at all the rest of the year. But um, yeah, that's just, that's the way the term is going to go. And I, you know, the nice thing about Purdue's team is as good as we are, you know, the, the chances of that happening are, are much fewer than I think last year where maybe we weren't as confident as a team and we weren't playing at such a high level. Yeah. So like you personally, do you, are are you were like what, what what's your mindset going into the tournament this year? Because the Purdue you, you guys are the, you guys oh, are the betting <laughs> yeah I know you guys are the betting favorite. Like I I just looked on DraftKings this morning and it's Purdue it's you're not tied with anyone you're plus eight hundred you are people despite this stretch that we're on of Purdue and the NCAA tournament forget all that Purdue the Purdue Boilermakers are the betting favorite at today to win the national championship. Um, and yet I wouldn't, I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't fault you for having some concerns. So like, what are you like, forget the past. We're focused on this or um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just curious about the psyche. Cause it is getting closer. And I think at the start of the season, you're like, whatever that was like, you kind of talk yourself into it, but the calendar has turned to February. This has the last couple of years for what it's worth. February has not exactly been kind to Purdue. Like in like last year on February 1st, Purdue was 22 and 20, uh, 22 and one, I'm sorry. And they finished seven and five down the stretch, and two years ago, twenty one and three, and finished eight and five. Um, so yeah, like, are are you someone that like thinks about that sort of thing, or or is it just like, you know, we've addressed those concerns, and and I trust that this group will be a little bit different. Yeah, it's kind of case by case for sure, because you know last year was just so weird because it didn't really make sense because we won the Big Ten tournament, mm -hmm. so you would think like, oh, this team we, must be playing right. at a really high level, like. 
Our confidence must be sky high. I mean, you watch those Big Ten tournament games. Like, I didn't feel like we were playing at no. a super high level. Like, yeah. I feel like we honestly caught some team. Like, we beat Ohio State. I didn't think they played very well that day. Mm-hmm. We beat Penn State. They couldn't throw it in the ocean against us. And obviously, some of that is credit to our defense or whatever. But a lot of that is the ball didn't go in that day. And so it was kind of weird. Like, we were winning, but I didn't feel like we were playing nearly as well as, like, we played out in Portland, for example. Um, so, like, did I think we were going to lose to a 16 seed? I did not. But, you know, the fact that we didn't play well in that game didn't stun me, I guess I'll say. Whereas this year, I feel like we're a much better team. Lance Jones, of course, as we talked about, has given us an added dimension. And so maybe ask me that question, you know, right. after the Big Ten tournament this year on how I feel as far as how we're playing. But I do think this team will be playing and peaking at a higher level come March this year compared to last year. On a, on a more positive note, who on this uh, on this Purdue roster – um, not including uh, you know, the freshman or, or Lance Jones. Like, who who of that core group? We talked about Edie and, and Braden Smith, obviously. Like someone else. Like, what what is who who's a guy that's like stepped up in a way that maybe the national media or the national fan wouldn't really recognize? But like, as a guy who's in it every day, you're like, dang, I'm I'm seeing some better stuff out of him, and and uh, it's like an unheralded thing to see how much better he's gotten. Well, I will say, I think that tandem. Uh, of Trey Kaufman Renna and Mason Gillis, those guys playing the four position. I feel like they've done a nice job of kind of like hamming and egging it, like you say, like in golf, where like if one guy's got it, maybe the other guy doesn't, but you ride the guy who's kind of got it that day. Like Trey mm-hmm. Kaufman Renna against Illinois was really playing extremely well. And so we kind of rode that hot hand. Whereas there's been some games where Trey hasn't really had it, but Mason, who's shooting the ball at a really high level this year, uh, I think he's 50 50, 85 guy at the moment. Um, you know, we've been able to play him a lot and he's got a lot of experience. So I think those two guys at that power four position have really complement each other well as far as yin, yin and yang a little bit. Um, and then Camden Heidi, the, the redshirt freshman off the bench, you know, his minutes are a little sporadic as far as how much he plays game to game, but he's shooting the ball from three on, on a pretty sm- it's low, low, low volume, but he's shooting the ball from three really well. And he gives us that added athleticism, that dimension off the bench. Um, and another guy that I don't think, think will be afraid to take big shots in a big moment if, if, if he has the opportunity. So I think we're just we're just much more well-rounded as a team, and it's been fun to see you know everybody kind of bind into their role and uh, trying to win. Can you uh, can you tell me how to feel about Ethan Morton and his four years at Purdue? Because <laughs> um, I, I saw you were so happy that he almost got. Dude, he, yeah, I know run. someone ruined it and pointed out that he had some steals, and uh, and because I yeah. saw the original box score, he did nothing for twenty minutes. Um, I have nothing against Eaton Morton. In fact, he's a he's a trillion god. So like, I I love him for that yes. reason. But I I have especially last year, I would, I would watch Purdue and just scratch my head and I'd be like, listen, I understand he's good defensively, but there's a lot of zeros in that box score and a lot of minutes played as well. Like, what is going on here? Um, obviously his his minutes have dropped this year, uh, and he's not in the starting lineup anymore. Um, but like, what he, he he's a locker room guy for sure, good leader. Uh, a four-year Purdue player. He, he's every time I talk about Ethan Morton, I get Purdue fans that are like, "Come on, man! He's you can't be shitting on Ethan Morton like that." Um, just tell tell me tell me the good things about Ethan Morton so I can become a fan of his, other than just like pointing and laughing at his trillions. No, for sure. Uh, Ethan's actually one of the guys I get along with really well on the team, so uh, he's a good dude. Um, and, and, and so it's tough for Ethan, right? Like in high school and you experience this as a guy who's a really good high school player and you have the ball in your hands all the time. And then you go to the next level and you're not in that same situation as you were in high school. And and that's been tough for Ethan, of course, because he was a ball dominant dude in high school, yeah. uh, Pennsylvania player of the year, always having the ball in his hands. You can play through mistakes, so on and so forth. Well, at this level, you know, he acknowledges that Braden Smith and Lane shows some of these other guys are better with the ball in their hands. And so he's had to, like last year, he had to play more of that off-ball role, stand in the corner, try to, you know, hit an open shot if it comes your way. And that's just not who he's wired as a player. So it, it's, it's been a hard adjustment for him. So that's, you know, why you see him make the extra pass a lot. You know, it's not his game to be a catch-and-shoot guy. And so you see him be pretty unselfish, which I think also has its benefits, right? Like he doesn't take bad shots. He doesn't try to do stuff he can't do. Sometimes guys, as you know, get themselves in a big, big trouble with their coaching staff when they try to do things they can't do. Yeah. And so Ethan, you know, to his credit, he gets the ball to Zach Eady, other guys who can score. And then on the defensive end, he is a very good defensive player. He's, you know, he doesn't have elite 
size and quickness or athleticism, but he's one of those guys is he's got to play. You understand those really good positional defenders who are always in the right spot, uh, help side, understanding the scouting report uh, as far as player tendencies and all those things. That's what Ethan does really well. He's kind of a connector from that standpoint. He does a lot of those things. This is a classic, you know, saying, of course, he does a lot of those things that don't show up in the box score Mm -hmm. per se, Mm -hmm. which is why he gets those. Literally. literally, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) The Mark Titus show is brought to you by body armor, real hydration, real ingredients packed with electrolytes, vitamins, and nothing artificial body armor has great tasting flavors like strawberry, banana, and blue raspberry. Not only do we hydrate here at Barstool with Body Armor, but some of the best athletes in the world do as well, like Christian McCaffrey, Joe Burrow, Ronald Acuna Jr., C.D. Lamb, and Bryce Young. My favorite lately has been the Cherry Lime, which I'm holding in my hand right now. I was a strawberry banana guy all through the summer. Uh, I have shifted to Cherry Lime. I don't know if it's a seasonal thing with me. Probably not. It's more of a case that just like all these flavors are really good from Body Armor, and uh, it's hard to pick your favorite. It's like picking your favorite child. Uh, but right now, my favorite child is Cherry Lime. Available in stores nationwide, but you can head o- over, head on over now to Body Armor Store on Amazon and get yours today. Go get some Body Armor Super hydra- Superior Hydration. It is so good, and uh, the flavors are great. We, it's all we drink around here. Uh, it's all we drink here at Barstool. Go to, go to get some Body Armor now, and thank me later. <laughs> uh, all right, so big Wisconsin game coming up on Sunday. Um, I, I don't think it's necessarily for the Big Ten Championship, but it feels like the game that you look back on and you're like, that was the one. If we, you know, Purdue were to lose, you might think we, we let that opportunity slip away. Um, you, or you win and you're like, that was when the season, that's when we kind of put our stamp on, yes, the Big Ten is ours and we own it. Um, this Wisconsin team has, uh, I don't want to say come out of nowhere. There were some there were some guys that were high on them coming into the season, but uh, the A.J. Store transfer has really rejuvenated uh, Wisconsin basketball and now they're ranked sixth in the country and they're rolling and they are a team like you said Bobby like Peru can struggle with uh, perimeter guys that are athletic and 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 playmakers on the on the perimeter um, that feels like this Wisconsin team to me so like what do you see going into Sunday how how big of a game is this for uh, your perception of this Purdue team how much should we make of this like all that sort of thing what what is what does Sunday look like to you yeah, it's a big game. I, you know, I hope it's not like it was two years ago where Chucky Hepburn's banking in threes and I have to watch Barstool Big Cat and the rest of the Barstool crew just taking that, their shirts off. That's right. That, that was the, that was the chest painting game. That's right. That's right. I remember being like, oh, that's really cool. The Barstool guys are there. And then realizing like, oh, we just lost on the, you know, bank shot, the buzzer. Um, yeah, that was a that was a crazy moment for the, for the Badgers that night. But um, yeah, hopefully we don't have that from a Purdue standpoint to have that happen again. But yeah, it's a big game. I mean, this is probably on paper you know, our most difficult road game of the season. Mm-hmm. So certainly a chance to make, um, you know, a big exclamation point as far as going on the road. I know how your dad feels about road wins. You know, you got to be able to prove it. Yeah, that's true. Road. So, well, I we mean, my dad, <laughs> I will say I should, I should uh, break the fourth wall a little bit. The Bobby, when we were setting this interview up said, um, my only request is that your dad joins and my dad has a, he has boy, a hell of a habit, Bobby, of not being available I can't after, believe it. after Purdue I see wins. him at these golf outings yeah. every summer, we chop it up and then he doesn't even want to come on and talk. To he's got, then. he's got a lot of free time until Purdue wins or IU loses. And both of those two things have been happening a lot this year. And suddenly my dad isn't quite as available. Um, I don't know how he does it. I don't his schedule fills up quick when the Hoosiers aren't good. <laughs> no, no, disappointed for sure. He's dodging me, but um, yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's it's, uh, it's going to be a great atmosphere in Madison, for sure. The Kohl Center is, is definitely one of the best places that you, you, know, you experience it firsthand. It's such a fun place to play at. Um, they have a great student section. And, that, you know, that Wisconsin team, you point out A.J. Store, Blackwell, the freshman, mm-hmm. added athleticism for them. They definitely needed that as far as their perimeter defense and their shot making. And then all those guys that came back from last season, I feel like Stephen Crowell's definitely taken kind of that leap this year. He's really scoring pretty pretty effectively with his back to the basket. Uh, last year, I'll be interested to see what we do. Last year, we kind of put a cross match situation. We put Zach Eady on Tyler Wall because you know how Tyler Wall he's so good against those yeah. guys. Like again, you know, at his size or a little look, little um, beneath him, he can just wheel and deal, get those angles. And we put Zach on him and did a you know pretty pretty good job of negating some of his ability at the rim. So. But now with Crowell being so good on the block, I don't know if, if that's the avenue they're going to go. So it's going to be a tough matchup. they got a lot of guys who can shoot. Max Klesman's really elevated his game yeah. this year. Um, he had that big-time game against 
uh, the Hoosiers in that interesting um, scenario that went down. But um, it's going to be it's going to be a tough matchup because, you know, we just talked about our perimeter defense, you know, guys like Fletcher and Braden. Uh, that's not their strength, per se. So they're going to be, you know, tasked with guarding guys on the perimeter for Wisconsin who can make plays. And I'm sure Lance Jones will get that A.J. store assignment. And that should be a fun one to watch. What what does success look like for this Purdue team then? I, I guess that's the I, I'm I'm fast forwarding my my brain here and I'm thinking like, you know, saying you have to win a national championship is insane. I think that's insane right. for any team. Like, of course, there are some programs that that go into every season and they say we're trying to win a national championship and all, that's all fine and well. But there's only one team that can and a lot has to go right. And uh, if you really look back on every season, you say we didn't win the national championship, we're failures. That that is just an absurd premise in my mind. Um, so I don't want to. I don't want to like you know. I, I'm I'm just like fast forwarding. Peru goes to the national championship and loses. That would be insane to be like, ha ha, they did it again. They fa- they came up short in the NCAA tournament. Can't win the big yeah, one. Yeah, they can't win the big <laughs> one. Ah, I knew it. Triple overtime in the national championship. They can't win. Right. Um. But of course there is a line, uh, Bobby, there is like a, you know, you guys losing the first round again, you're going to be like, this is very disappointing. So, uh, where, where do you personally, like, what is the goal? Is it final four? Is it like, I mean, the goal is national champion. What is like, what does success feel like? What is, what what will get you to go, ah, finally the monkey off the back. We did it. Right. You know, I I think probably like within the program, they're feeling like it's final four bus kind of thing. Right. Like obviously once you get to that point, you, you want to cut the net down and win the whole thing. But, uh, this team clearly, you know, has the chops to make it to the final four. I would think most people would think they're one of the best four teams in the country at, at the moment. And so I think, yeah, absolutely. Internally it's final four bus, but you got to win four games, for, you know, to get there. And, um, you know, I would be extremely surprised if uh, something happened crazy in the first round. Again, I think this team, because of the Lance Jones edition and yeah. the improved experience of everybody, you know, they're going to be able to get through that. But is, that's the thing is they're going to be nerves for that first game. Yeah. I, I imagine there's going to be some serious nerves for that first game because of what transpired. last. Well, year. yeah. I mean, I, I keep talking about it. Virginia, when they won the national title the next year, they were down halftime. Yes. They were down at halftime to Gardner Webb the next game. But Crazy. I actually, I actually think Bobby that like that helps having lost to the 16 already that if Purdue were down, you're down five at half to say to another 16 seed. You're in the halftime locker room. Yeah, it's not great vibes, but like, surely someone's just going to be like, "We've already seen the boogeyman. What do we have to be scared of?" Like, it's not like, like who cares? Like at this point, everybody already thinks we're fraud. Like what you know? Like you've already processed all that. So just go out and play basketball. Like stop overthinking everything. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you how much uh, non-Purdue basketball are you watching, either college or more specifically high school in the state of Indiana? Because I. Uh, I've moved to Chicago, Bobby, and I'm closer to the Indiana high school scene. But uh, Dad and I have gone to a few games. Um, Brownsburg fell off a cliff. We stink now, and uh, I'm just curious how much do you do you have an opportunity to watch more basketball other than just the Boilers, or are you so consumed with that that you're not getting out much? No, I mean I watch a ton of college ball for sure. I mean I'm super into that, obviously. Uh, so a lot of Big Ten, um, of course. Now the Purdue's been really good the last handful of years. You're, I'm always watching the other top 10, top 15 teams. Mm-hmm. Cause you know, you're trying to jostle for the seating in the tournament and hoping some of those teams that you're going to be trying to battle for seating with maybe you know, drop a game here or there. So, you know, I'm definitely into all that, but I wish I could tell you, I get to more high school games, but yeah. um, obviously with the travel schedule with Purdue, a lot of like Friday, if we play Saturday, like we leave Friday um, and then we play Saturday. True, yeah. So I'm on the road or I'm with Purdue, you know, a lot of times. So there's definitely those conflicts, but I will say, like, after you are just watching college basketball up close all the time, watching high school, you know, the speed of the game. It's hard. No shot. It's hard. Yeah. It, it's a little hard. It's a little hard, I will say. I'll That's admit. what happens. But I, I love high school basketball as well. That's what happens to the NBA guys, too, you know. They come back to college, and they're like, what the hell is this sport? And I'm like, listen, man, that's why – that's why, I didn't, you know, I think ultimately, Bobby, I think that's why you and I didn't go to the NBA. I think we both could have, and we thought to ourselves, right. if we do, we're not going to be able to enjoy college basketball as much. So no thank you, NBA, you know? Yeah, we don't want to have our minds yeah. you know, change like that. We want to be able to enjoy college hoops for what it is. <laughs> uh, Bobby, thanks so much for making time, man. Uh, best of luck the rest of the season. Um, I love – you know, you and, and Hummel and all the Purdue people. I, I said this to you when we, we used to play against each other. Like, some part of me felt like – like, I always felt like I, I – I, 
I, I always I don't want to say this. Not that I belonged at Purdue, but like I I was always like shocked at how could have well been an honorary boiler. Yeah, sure. like like I really like honestly every time I like talk to you guys, I was like, man, I get along with those guys so great. It was like Purdue and Wisconsin were the two programs where I was like, yeah, I could if I woke up tomorrow and I had to like go to their practices, I would fit right in. Um, so I do respect the program, but I love making Purdue jokes as much as the next guy, and I I can't stop. But I I I. Uh, I genuinely do uh, uh, hope it's uh, it, it's an enjoyable season for you guys, and um, you know you get a little bit of redemption this year, and uh, and and you get a smile on your face. And I feel bad for Hummel too, by the way, that that literally every time you guys lose to an unranked team, he's calling the game. I always find that fascinating. Yeah. He's had a lot of bad luck with that yeah. last year. In particular, it was rough. Like literally every big game yeah. that we lost, he was on the call, and Purdue fans would hate him because he would like say that there was a the foul against Purdue was a legitimate call yeah. and, and then yeah right but no uh, big big year. <laughs> big step last night though you beat Northwestern and not only did you beat Northwestern you beat Northwestern with Robbie Hummel on the call so That's, maybe yeah. this year's team really is different you know it could be different yeah, yeah. no for sure Rob, Rob's obviously a great friend of mine you know we played together a couple of years and uh yeah he's He's definitely uh, taking his game to the next level. I feel like as far as his compensating goes, and yeah, he's he's moving up the ranks. So, but yeah, he's gotten a lot of Purdue games this year, which has been, you know, I'm sure hard for him to try to be as yeah. unbiased as he can. But he uh, calls he, yeah, call, he he does a great job. He calls every game. I don't know how he does it. Like every, game. I feel bad that I feel bad though because like when he does our games, everyone like mutes him and pulls me up on the radio. <laughs> they listen to my, to my call, so I kind of feel bad for him. Is for that nothing. true? People, Purdue fans aren't don't love Hummel. No, I'm like, kidding. I'm oh, kidding. I was trying to hype myself. Oh, okay. Well, no, I because because the way you said it though, like Robbie is so good that like if you didn't know he went to Purdue, you wouldn't know that he went to Purdue. You know, so like you you could watch him call a Purdue game and not realize that he is a Boilermaker. But so I did believe you there for a second that like Purdue fans were like, why isn't Robbie, you know, being on more no, like, of a homer? I'll go back sometimes and watch you know our our wins like big games and stuff, and you know I do feel like he does a pretty good job. He's of awesome. Being on yeah. Um, to the best of his ability. So I, I feel like he, he does a good job, but I know, you know, that's tough. You can't please everybody. So, yeah. Um, all right, Bobby, thanks so much, man. Appreciate you making time. Best of luck to the boilers. And, uh, I, I know this, I will certainly be in Phoenix, uh, for the final. Yeah, I hope because, to see you in Phoenix. Yeah, this year. Buddy. So I, I hopefully hope for your sake, I see you there, man. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, buddy. Take care. All right, man. Quick break to talk about Visible. Ever wish you could call a foul on your wireless carrier for their hidden fees? Then it's time to switch to Visible. Switch to Visible, the wireless company with nothing to hide, and get one-line wireless with unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon, just $25 a month, every month, taxes and fees included, no hidden fees. Visible is the wireless company with nothing to hide, no gotchas, no hidden fees. Uh, It is just $25 a month. And like I said, taxes and fees are included in that. Unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon. Switch now at Visible.com. Do not let hidden fees stop you from being a fan of wireless. Switch to Visible and save bench wireless with hidden fees. Switch to Visible now. Go to Visible.com to switch your wireless to Visible. Do it now. Rate with service on the Visible plan. For, For additional terms and network management practices, see visible.com uh i know a lot of you out there are are dealing with wireless carriers that have a lot of hidden fees and you shouldn't be doing that anymore so switch to visible solve your problems go do it now visible.com all right thank you to bobby uh fun talking to him um he showed me uh this is just a little something for the uh the hoosiers that are listening and i I don't mean indiana hoosiers i mean i don't mean iu fans i mean people from the state of indiana bobby uh, we were talking about high school basketball and off air. He showed me his uh, Hoosier basketball magazine that he got for this year, and I got very excited about it. And wave of nostalgia rushed over me. But uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Bob, Bobby and I used to play against each other way back in the day, and I, I really regret telling him. Anytime I'm uh, in front of a microphone and I say that I would have fit in just fine at Purdue, it's something that doesn't sit right with me, and I need to go home and uh, reevaluate some things. But you know. I, I was caught in a moment of, of honesty there. Uh, moving on, a couple things before we get out of here. Number one, um, I uh, it's way late at this point. I don't think anybody cares anymore, but I just want to put a bow on it and do a little cleanup duty on the Jeff Goodman versus the uh, Blue Demon Degenerate situation. Um, so I inadvertently, last show, got thrown into the middle of it all and uh, 
people, you know, we teased that we were, that we had Goodman on the show. I, I left in the part where Goodman called, but then we didn't leave in the phone call. Obviously, people were not happy about that. Obviously, you wanted to listen to the whole phone call. Um, stuff has come out since then. Uh, you know, I don't think Goodman has been absolved of anything, but uh, I just wanted to, for my part in all of it, provide a little bit of clarity um, and just say, like, what happened? So first of all, I had no desire to talk to Goodman. I had no desire to include the phone. If Jeff Goodman would have called me 20 minutes after I got done recording, like 20 minutes later than what he did when we were done recording the show, I would not have put any of it in there. I would not have like made TJ and Cody come back so we could re-record and be like, oh damn, I just talked to Goodman and got the details. Um, it was more that it happened live or live to tape, I guess. Like we're sitting here recording, he calls me, and I'm just like, well, this is wild. We should just keep the cameras rolling, right? Uh. And to be completely honest, at that time, and still now, I guess, uh, I, I hadn't watched a second of the documentary. And I, I, yeah, I, ha- I still haven't. So my understanding, and like the, 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 the part of me that was dunking all over Goodman was more because Goodman's a goober. And like the whole reason this was a story to me was because Jeff Goodman was threatening to throw a guy in prison and said, when I get some free time in the offseason, I'm going to hunt you down. And that was hilarious to me. And I, that was all the context I needed. So like... I was in the dark about what this was about. I just kind of knew bits and pieces. And to see Jeff Goodman DMing somebody that was absolutely hilarious to me, right? So uh, that's why I felt comfortable enough like talking to Jake Marsh about how funny this story is. We talked about it on the Yak. Uh, we, we were we were making fun of Goodman. Um, and then Goodman calls me and shares his side of the story. And, and my hesitancy, the part of me that like walked stuff back and the part of me that was hesitant and the part of me that said we shouldn't put that phone call on the, the show and everything, it was not that Goodman convinced me that he's not a goober. It wasn't like, oh, Jeff, great point. It was more that he played the one card um, that worked on me, which is the John Fanta card. And when he, he, he played the angle, which – you know, people are poking holes in, in this, I understand. But, like, when Goodman called me and was just basically – that that's basically what he said on the phone call, and that was the reason I didn't want to include it because it wasn't my place to tell people that John Fanta's father has passed away. John Fanta has since, uh, you know, shared that publicly, um, you, you know, on, on his own terms. But I didn't want to put that in the podcast because I wasn't sure if Fanta – if that was something Fanta wanted people to know. So Goodman calls me and tells me that. That was the piece of it. He said that that Fanta was – this is just the story he tells me is that, like, Fanta had not problems but, like, wasn't feeling great about the documentary. Meanwhile, he's dealing with his dad's death. And I, as he's telling me all this, I was I just, just kind of throwing my hands up, and I was like, listen, Jeff, the whole reason I was talking about this is because you're a goober that wanted to throw a guy in prison. If you're telling me that John Fanta, uh, you know, is dealing with something actually serious – that is the one card you can play on me that will work. I love John Fanta dearly, um, and and you know I'm I my heart breaks for him and his family that he's dealing with his father's death, and uh, yeah. So he he said that to me, and I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna I, I want to wash my hands of all of this. I want out. I just want out of the whole thing. And that's kind of how I tried to handle it on the last show that we did, and uh, it obviously didn't go over well. TJ, it didn't like people didn't love that like I was. I, I, there was a misconception that I was on Goodman's side, mm. and the internet was not. It wasn't that big of a deal. No. The internet was mad at me for a lot of things this week, but <laughs> <laughs> so it was hard to keep track of I, it all. I'll but, take some responsibility. We gave you a, a, a bad edit, not a bad edit, a good, a good edit because the clip went very viral. But we kind of set you up to in a in a weird spot with that edit. Yeah, intentionally because we knew it would you know promote it the would, podcast. Yeah, the well, people. Yeah, which it did. But yeah, uh, we love Fanta. No, I just wanted to I wanted to clean that up because uh, that's not you know you can be mad at me and I understand I understand if I was listening to a show and you you got Jeff Goodman on the podcast and then you didn't play it I'd be like what the fuck I I yeah. get I get why people were fired up but I just wanted to tell my part of it as to why because uh once once he started saying that too I realized I was too deep into it because I hadn't even watched the documentary so he's telling me that there's like clips of guys talking about Hitler and cocaine and all this and I'm like what the fuck is this documentary dude and I don't. I never took a stance that's like this guy, this the, uh, the DePaul blue demon degenerate guy is in the wrong and Goodman's in the right or vice versa. I just like, it, as Goodman was overwhelming me, I was like, this is, I am, I am way too uh, in the dark to, to say definitively what's going on here. All I know is you told me John Fanta is feeling some type of way and his father just passed. And that's all I need to know to hit the eject button on all of this and get out. So, um, 
since then, I have, you know, I, I, I just wanted to like go on record as saying that I do think that good, I'm not on team, I'm not on Goodman's side. And I do understand the people, the point of view that's like Goodman is only playing that card because he got caught like looking like a douche and he's trying to like make himself look better. And if that's your point of view, go, I, I listen, I, I, I do not doubt that that could have happened absolutely i'm just telling you that that was a risk that i wasn't willing to take that if you you tell me john john fant is going through something and me engaging in that something is making it worse i will stop doing that something so uh you know i i that's just that's just how that's just how it all went down so i i was not on goodman's side i was very much uh i i, I love the idea i having not watched the documentary so maybe this is going to get me in trouble because I, I truly don't know what was in it um I do love the idea of like independent journalists, if that's what you want to call them, making documentaries and, and you know, getting into the nitty gritty of the story of Ed Cooley leaving Providence. Because I do imagine if if Fox Sports commissioned some sort of short film about Ed Cooley's departure from Providence, it's not really going to tell the story. It's going to be very sugar coated. It's going to be, you know, it's not going to be the real story. It's going to be what they what Ed Cooley wants them to say, like all this sort of thing. Um, so I do think that 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 idea is something I very much support. So like I don't I don't love the idea of Goodman trying to tell the guy what he can and can't put out there. Um, but anyway, I've, I've spent too much time talking about it. I just wanted for clarity to explain what happened on last show, where I stand on the whole issue that I I think zero people in the world care about anymore. I think everybody has moved past, but um, that's that's what happened. And I I will say this too. Uh, Maybe maybe part of me do, that wanted to be on uh, the Paul Blue Demon Degenerate, whatever the guy's uh, name, I, I can't remember. Is it Blue Demon yep. Degenerate? I keep messing it up. Which is crazy that that's where this all stemmed from is a DePaul, DePaul burner anonymous account. Burner yeah. Account. yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I want to be on his side, but TJ, today I saw the news. I'm not on, I'm not number 33 anymore. In fact, his list he's got a list of one, Josh Shirts. He's all in on Josh Shirts wow. to take the DePaul job, so... You know, I don't blame him because I I did seem to appear to be on Goodman's team, but uh, yeah, that stinks, man. That stinks. I it looks like I I'm not going to be the coach of DePaul Blue Demons anymore. And I really I'm thought sorry that, that was going to happen. Yeah, I'm sorry that you have to deal with that. Yeah, dude, it's a bummer. Um, Colorado State are they still hiring? Colorado, I mean, Chicago, Chicago State? Chicago State are they still hiring? They're always hiring. Right. Chicago State is always. <laughs> that's a job that'll keep coming up, and uh, I'll take a swing at it at some point again. Um, this weekend's awesome. Yeah. Great slate of college basketball, uh, on purpose, you know, no football this weekend. Um, we're going to do a show after the Super Bowl that, uh, I'm going to do my best to, if, if you're someone who doesn't really pay attention to college basketball, but wants to get into it and you're listening to this show because you're starting to scratch that itch a little bit. I will, I am planning on doing a show for the casuals after the Super Bowl to get everybody caught up to speed. Um, so apologies in advance if you are a diehard and you're like, I don't need you to tell me that UConn is is good. <laughs> you know, I don't I don't need that. This is boring me. Um, but I like to do that after every Super Bowl because there are a, a massive influx of people that that will turn to this show and other college basketball shows and uh, are just ready for some college basketball content. But uh, if for some reason you're listening now. This weekend is a great opportunity. No football on this weekend. Um, and the slate is as follows. Tennessee at Kentucky, which was the game I was most excited about before this week happened, before Tennessee loses to South Carolina and Kentucky loses to Florida. Um, but in some ways, that makes it even more intriguing uh, because both of these teams are a little desperate now. Like the idea of the one of these teams is going to be on a two-game losing streak when I thought – you know, heading into the week, they, they, they were both good enough to win a national championship. And I still probably think no matter what happens this week, that they both will be still good enough to win a national championship. But yeah, th th this becomes a much bigger game for two teams that, uh, have, have serious sec title, uh, aspirations. That's the game that I'm most excited about still probably now that I think about it, I think I'm still most excited about that Dalton connect versus this Kentucky team there. It's two, those are two entities that I've spent a ton of time talking about on this show, how much I love them. Reed Shepard and, and the boys, uh, Rob Dillingham's awesome. They just don't play defense and Tennessee just doesn't play offense except for Dalton connect. So that'll be a fun game. I, I was talking to big T who I want to get on the show. Uh, we're going to do a Dalton connect, uh, session if you want to call it that where he just comes on and and the two of us just 
basically just talk about how much we love Dalton Connect. But uh, his his analysis of this game this this weekend is he hit me with the uh, we could win by thirty or we could lose by thirty, which it it is really telling you nothing, but is funny nonetheless. I love when fans do that. We could win by thirty or lose by thirty, but he does say he it didn't really feel like he said or anything in between. So I don't know. He's he's picturing blowout. He just doesn't know who which team's gonna blow out the other. Uh, other games, Houston at Kansas, mentioned that one earlier. Huge game for both teams. Huge, uh, you know, if, if, if you want to get carried away and start letting your mind really go crazy um, and really start filling in some blanks and get really reckless on predicting the future, this could be a game you, you point back at five years from now and say that's when the power of balance was shifted in, in Big 12. Houston came into the league in year one. Kelvin Sampson went into Lawrence, went into Allen Fieldhouse, you know, took care of business against a Kansas team that had two All-Americans. Uh, and, yeah, the, it's not going to be. It's not, you know, Houston might win. It's probably not going to be all that. But, uh, you know, Kansas is not – all. Kansas is off to the worst start in, in, in the Big 12 uh, under Bill Self ever. And you have a Houston team that, that their defense is – disgusting just absolutely disgusting defense um but yeah i'm curious if they can generate enough offense that's that's going to be the concern with houston as the season wears on but they uh the the advanced metrics love houston love houston and uh this is a big opportunity for for houston to win over the eye test guys like myself so i um, excited for that one duke at north carolina um you know the, the, some juice has been taken out of the rivalry for sure uh at some point Duke Carolina is going to get the country back. Uh, it's not going to happen this weekend, I don't think. It's probably not going to happen this year. But uh, it, it will come back, and I think it's a slow thing that will that'll get it back. And I do expect this to be a really good game between two really good teams. Um, so that that matters. That's part of the – part of getting the juice back is games like this, where it's like, yeah, there's not, we're not going to pretend like this game has all the stakes in the world, especially given recent Duke Carolina games. But these are very much two good teams, tons of talent, um, and you have two guys in Filipowski and R.J. Davis. They're not going to be guarding each other, so it's not like a one-to-one -one comparison of them going up against each other. But uh, you have guys on either team that are that are first-team All-American good and National Player of the Year type good in any other year without Zach Eady. So, um, yeah, I, I do Carolina I, as much as I want to pretend like I don't care that much because Roy and Kay are gone. Uh, this is – if they were wearing any other uniforms and you told me this was a rivalry game, this would be a game I'd be very excited for. So – uh, that one's going on. We got UConn at St. John's and MSG for maybe the last time in a while. Rick Pitino seems to be uh, adamant on moving the UConn game out of Madison Square Garden because, you know, the, the Huskies fans show, show up and show out every time they play in the Garden, and he wants a little more of a home court advantage. So this might be the last year that uh, UConn plays in the Garden before the Big East tournament uh, for a while, uh, or at least against St. John's in, in the Garden. So there's that to look forward to and a St. John's team that, that is, that is better than, um, I think national people realize, but this is a great opportunity for them. Number one team in the country coming into to MSG, Iowa state Baylor. We have Texas at TCU. Uh, I saw that the uh, barstool TCU account is sending horns down t-shirts to the TCU student section. I'm fired up about that. Um, I have to imagine that TCU, the TCU administration is not going to tell them to take those off. I have to imagine 500 is a, is a little that seems like an operation to try and get 500 students to change their shirts. Yeah. It's a one thing when it's nine students in the front right. row, but when it's every it's like kind of like the uh the clown face towel gate or day at the Patriots stadium where That's when right. Dell was there and they handed out thousands of towels right. like they can do some sort of reconnaissance but 500 shirts. Are Five, be, yeah, you can't. And, and the, the more you start trying to take them away, the more power you're going to give the student yeah. section, and they're going to fight back harder. So. It's also, it, it would continue the Streisand effect where if they go after these shirts, right. like, what's the, some, the some cool game, to do? A thousand yeah. shirts. Yeah. Yeah. The stri Which I, I honestly, I'd rather that. Just make it a bigger and bigger issue until like the entire stadium yeah. <laughs> is holding up signs. <laughs> Yeah, just because. Yeah, Texas plays their first game of the NCAA tournament. <laughs> and yeah, somehow the entire stadium is wearing t-shirts and holding a sign with the horns down. And they're all doing it together, like yeah, like it's. Uh, Te Texas drops out of the tournament because of horns down. Yeah, <laughs> they just opt out. They're so offended. Um, under the radar game this weekend. It's a big one. Uh, Drake is at Indiana State, top two teams in the Missouri Valley. Um, this Indiana State team, as a reminder, I had a vision, I had a dream that Indiana State 
was going to the Sweet 16. Uh, I don't know what to do with that information. Um, I don't know if I should gamble on that. I don't know how to really do that. Can you bet on teams going to the Sweet 16 right now? I don't. I don't know if you I really don't can. I don't really think you, you can do, do that. Four, you can do for Final sure. Four and National Championship, but um, yeah, I had a vision, and and I'm going to stick with that. Like when the bracket comes out, come hell or high water, if if Indiana State is in that bracket, I'm advancing them to the Sweet 16. I got to set a reminder in my phone. Um, but yeah, Drake at Indiana State. Uh, this weekend, uh, conference player of the year implications as well. And, and team, you know, team championship, regular season championship implications. So that's a big one. We got Richmond at VCU, uh, in the A-10, which is a great college basketball rivalry or so I've been told, uh, I've been wanting to go to that one for a while. Um, and I just keep forgetting. I keep forgetting. Had I known that this was this weekend, had I, had I had any sort of foresight or whatsoever, maybe I would be down in Richmond, uh, this weekend for the, uh, Richmond VCU game, but I'm a big dumb idiot and didn't realize the game was happening this weekend. But Richmond team, top of the A10, beat Dayton and uh, feeling good about themselves. VCU is always pretty good, so that's a that's a fun one too. And then of course on Sunday, Peru at Wisconsin for Big Ten supremacy. That one's going on as well. I think that's going to be a, a an incredible, incredible game. And Bob Bobby didn't want to say it because Purdue fans don't want to get too excited and get too far ahead of themselves. But I do think that this is a good litmus test for Purdue. Not just that they're going on the road and playing a good team and, and all the, you know, boilerplate, no pun intended, boilerplate uh, reasons that this would be a big win for Purdue. I do think the, the, the makeup of this Wisconsin team feels like – it, it could give Purdue some problems and it feels like a team that would give Purdue problems. So if Purdue can beat Wisconsin, it was Wisconsin, you go on the road, beat a top 10 team um, with the athletic guards, uh, with the, the length on the perimeter and also a seven footer who's not going to stop Edie, but you can, you have big guys that you can throw at Edie. Um, yeah. Wisconsin isn't a perfect team to play Purdue, but they check if you're looking for a team that, that, that can expose some of the weaknesses Exposes too strong of a word that can that can take advantage of some of the the weaknesses of Purdue. Wisconsin checks a lot of those boxes. So the flip side to that is if Purdue can in fact win in Madison this weekend, um, it would it would go a long way for me and in, in believing in Purdue being a little bit different this year. And especially like like we've said a few times throughout the show, this is the this is the type this is the time of year where things don't completely start falling apart for, for Purdue, but the dominance starts to wane a little bit and and they start to look a little bit more vulnerable uh certainly the last couple years so um big 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 game in madison and if wisconsin does win boy they are they are very much in the driver's seat to to win the big 10 for sure um but they did lose to penn state because that's how college basketball works that wisconsin looks unbeatable in big 10 play unless you're going to happy valley in which case good night (laughs) uh all right i think that's it you guys got anything else is that it? A billionaire wants to start a uh, steroid Olympics, and there's a debate going on line. There's a, an Olympics competition where all drugs are permitted and encouraged, and there's a debate online. Is that ethical? Whether it's a, not whether it's eth- ethical, whether you'd watch. Oh, whether you'd watch. Darren yeah. Ravel said he wouldn't watch a second of it, and he feels like he's in the vast majority of people. Oh, Darren Ravel's a goober. <laughs> I'd throw him on the goober list. Um, no, of course you'd watch. Are you crazy? Yeah. Of course we'd watch. What? I thought you were gonna say is it ethical? Because that gets a little dicey. Of right. Like, I don't. Yeah, I don't know if we should be incentivizing people to be doing, you know, unnatural things to their bodies like that. But then again, I you know that 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 one's a little tougher of a question. Um. But yeah, if they do in fact do it, if someone allows it to happen, yeah, I'm gonna watch that. Are you kidding me? Yeah. The uh, one of the co-founders of PayPal is investing in it and he's a billionaire. So it's incredible. I would love, I don't know what sport is affected the most, what Olympic sport is affected the most by steroids though. Cause it's not going to be like basketball. Like steroids only help so much in a game where there's precision. Right. Like, that. like it's yeah, not going to yeah. be like jet, like maybe like shot put, but you still have yeah. to learn how to do shot put. Well, there are, there are ways to take PEDs or, you know, enhance your body or whatever that aren't just anabolic, like, make me look like Mark McGuire and Barry Bonds right. type steroids. So like they're, I, you know, like the blood, do- like Lance Armstrong wasn't yeah, on, yeah. he wasn't on like, you know, he wouldn't have like five necks, but he was still doping. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That, that'd be kind of funny if it's like you, you only permit like one type of 
<laughs> thing for each league. So you'll, you can you can cheat, but it has to be this specific way yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah, the, the water polo, you're allowed to take Molly right you're before. Allowed to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And none of the players know what it is yeah. until... <laughs> <laughs> they they get it's it's just a red pill blue pill situation. Yeah, right. It's a literal red pill blue it's, pill. Yeah. One is a placebo, the other is some it's, sort of narcotic. Yeah, you just don't I would watch the is. fuck yeah. out of that. That would be awesome. Drug right? roulette Olympics, dude. Hell yeah, that would be incredible. I I I feel for old people, man. Like <laughs> I'm not even that old, and uh, I have I have moments of just like, what is this world anymore? Um, I can't imagine being like 80 years old. And you, when you were growing up, sports were just almost like a hobby. Like a, like if you really did grow up at a time where like NBA teams were taking public transportation, you know, or they're, they're flying on, on, they're not taking private flights and they're riding in buses and the locker rooms are those like, all the lockers are those like cage lockers, those metal cages that slam, you know, and like yeah. that's what the NBA was. And now you're looking up in 2024 and you have all the shit going on with, with college sports <laughs> and pro, you know, and the, 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 the live tour and the fucking steroids leagues now and all that sort of thing, dude. I, I feel for old people, old people. We do have a, we do have a very old audience. Um, all you old people out there, all you dinosaurs. Um, I feel for you. I do. I do from the bottom of my heart. Um, you're safe at the Mark Titus show. I will never laugh at you for being old and having old people opinions because I know it's only a matter of time until I'm right there with you. Um, all right, that's the show. Enjoy the weekend. Great weekend of college basketball. We'll be back uh, next week from Vegas, Las Vegas. we got to find some time to record these shows next week, dude. How are we yeah. going to do this? Uh, uh, I don't know. Monday. That's going to be a red pill, blue pill situation. I yeah. think. I'm going to be just on – Molly, on the Molly Titus just, show. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just going to be popping pills and say, pl- one of these, please help me. Um, but, yeah, we'll be doing show. I mean, yeah, I, I, we're, I'm going to Vegas on Sunday, and uh, we're going to be in Vegas all next week. So we're going to do a little college basketball slash Super Bowl crossover, I guess. I don't know. We'll see how it works. But uh, enjoy the weekend. We'll see you on the other side. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>